Hi everyone, it's been ages since I last came on um, and did a video so I thought I would pop one up today and actually I wanted to talk about my previous video um, about the fly garlic tincture, the Amanita tincture I made. Um, it was so popular I couldn't quite believe it so thanks for everybody who watched and took the time to comment and actually what I gathered from the comments was that there were loads of questions and other um, comments made and I really wanted to take the time to address those because you know I could have typed them but I really can't be asked today <laughs> and so I thought I'd pop on and kind of talk about it a little bit um, so one of the first things I wanted to talk about was the distinction between foraging and wild harvesting so I lead foraging walks a few times a year in, in the town I live and I can guarantee that there's always one particular troll who has to comment about how terrible I am for stripping wildlife and depriving them of everything. Um, but actually, do you know what? You know, that person's a bit of an arsehole. However, they do have legitimate questions about the environment, you know. Um, and, you know, I think with the state of the world as it is, it's important to address those concerns. Um, and so for me, the difference between wild harvesting and foraging is that foraging is not destructive. Foraging shouldn't be destructive. The point of foraging isn't to go out and find whatever you can and take all of it for yourself. Um, that is not foraging at all. Foraging is about building a connection to that land and the, the other creatures that live there. And it's about actually realising that we're a part of, of nature as well. And it's about taking only what we need, always in a respectful manner. You know, we it's it's not in our best interest to go to an area and strip it of everything that's there. Um, because we want to keep coming back, you know. And so, for me, foraging also includes, a, I suppose you could call it land stewardship, um, in a way. Wild harvesting, on the other hand, is often employed by drinks and food companies. And I always use elderflower as an example because gin is really popular at the moment and, you know, people like to experiment with lots of different mixes. And elderflower is, is quite a popular one. And, you know, when, when elderflower is in bloom, you'll often see people, you know, stripping whole trees and they've got lots of bags and, you know, and the, the problem with wild harvesting is that the aim is to get as much of the product as you can. And so, you know, you'll see whole trees stripped of the flowers. And that's a problem because the flowers themselves are a great source of food for many insects, which then in turn feed birds and blah, blah, blah. Um, but then it also means that there are no berries. And of course, we can use the berries. But of course, the berries do provide food for wildlife. Um, and so if you strip all of the flowers, you're not going to get any berries. And, you know, it's just not good to go out and take everything from a place. You know, we as humans should be trying to move away from that. And so for me, that's the distinction between wild harvesting and foraging. Um, so I just wanted to address that before we go on. So I had a lot of comments about how to prepare um, the Amanita. And I always dry mine. Um, if you are going to use something, and it doesn't matter whatever it is, whatever you forage for, whatever plant material it happens to be, if you're going to use something straight away, if you're going to make, I don't know, if you're going to make a medicine from it and use it within that week, then you really don't need to, to dry it because, <clears throat> you know, um, because you're going to use it. However, if you want to increase the shelf life of whatever it is you're making, you do need to dry the fungi or the plant out. Um, otherwise the, the excess water content will spoil. So I make tinctures, I make ointments, I make all sorts of stuff with lots of different kinds of plants. And I always dry mine because I do want that shelf life to increase. I try and live within the season. So that for me means that I will forage for something and I will dry it so that I can use it in those times when it's not in season. And that saves me having to kind of buy from who knows where. Um, so for me, it is about making the product last as long as possible. Um, and there are different ways you can do that. So when you get your mushroom um, or your fungi or whatever it is you are foraging, you want to kind of tidy it up a little bit. Now, mushrooms and fungi are 
they're so absorbent if you go foraging on a day after like it's been pissing it down the night before then you know the mushrooms are so heavy because they're like sponges and they soak up all the excess water and so you know you need to be able to prepare them so i don't tend to wash them too much if if it is a bit grimy and it does need to kind of get some of the stuff off i will just make a vinegar dilution um and just kind of soak the plants and the the mushrooms or plants and give them a quick swirl for about five seconds before emptying them out because i don't want them to soak up all of that water um if they're not too bad and it's got like a little bit of dirt or other bits and pieces you just want a soft brush and you can brush that off that's absolutely fine um to dry the the fungi in particular or any plant matter for that for that matter and um, there, there are different ways you can dry stuff um when i first started foraging i did say when my kids were really young and we only had one wage coming into the house and I was always skin like there was no money for anything else so air drying stuff has always been my go-to and you can do that in a in a few different ways um if you are collecting plant matter so leaves stems flowers you can just kind of bundle them up with some string and then hang them somewhere where it's out of like strong strong smells and you know quite a warm dry area that's absolutely fine um, with with mushrooms, what I tend to do or what I used to do was I would slice them up and then thread them through some some yarn and then hang them up to dry and that's that's a good method or you can um, if you have a, a suitable basket you can chop them up place them in the basket and then sit the basket somewhere kind of warm you know like on a radiator or next to a radiator that's a good method as well you can leave them on a dry windowsill um, a warm windowsill to dry out. Um, or you can get one of those machines. Um, oh, what's the bloody word? You know what I mean. Somebody put it in the comments. <laughs> um, or you can also slice them up and use your oven. So you turn your oven to the lowest possible setting, pop your sliced whatever onto a tray and pop it into the oven um, for hours. It does take a long time. So you'll need to do that on a day when you're going to be in for most of the day. Um, but that's how you can dry your stuff out. That's all of those methods I've used myself. So everything I talk about, it's stuff that I've done myself. It's stuff that, you know, it all comes from experience. And for me, that's part of the fun part of foraging. It's about experimenting, you know, um, have fun with it. There was also a comment that I really wanted to talk about. Um, and it's important to say that the comment wasn't RC or anything like that. Um, because otherwise I wouldn't entertain it. Um, I, I'm not into that shit. If you don't like what I put out, you can, you're can. you welcome to go and watch somewhere else. But it was a really important comment and it was something along the lines of, so I was making the tincture and the person said that the alcohol is really a poor extractor of the active ingredient um, for Amanita. And that is true. That's absolutely true. Um, and... There's a couple of reasons as to why I, I make the tincture. So first of all, I, I make several different things with, with the mushrooms. Um, and I guess how you extract the active ingredient very much depends on what you're going to be using it for. So for me, um, Amanita wouldn't be um, my go to to get high anyway. You know, if that's your biz, then that's your biz. But it wouldn't be my go-to um part of that is because they are foraged and so you know you know when we grow things for like medicine or for whatever they're grown in very um tightly controlled environments where everything is measured to to you know right down to the very fine details so whether that's the temperature the feed the amount of light and dark you know and so when when you forage all of those things all of those variables can affect the potency anyway so um you know from two different mushrooms or two different plants of the same species will have very different levels of the active ingredient i work a lot with datura and datura is a good example of that because um i will use the leaves and the flowers in in the things that i make with the datura plants however the, the levels of the active ingredient can vary so much in 
the leaves from one plant to another even when they're grown in very similar conditions um so when i'm using the torah i'll use the seed to make most of the stuff because you know although there are there are differences the seed are the seeds tend to be in my experience more um even and with the leaves it can be very varied depending on the time of year and all of that kind of stuff so whatever plant you're going to be using the the end result or what you want to use it for in in the end result will determine how you extract the active ingredient so if i wanted to extract the most from the amanita i would of course make a tea um but that is not my aim um when i use that tincture in my witchcraft practice um, and for me, this is where everything kind of starts coming together, the foraging and all of that kind of stuff and how we prepare the plant. So I consider myself to be an animist in that I see the whole of the natural world as being alive with spirit. And, you know, part of my witchcraft practice is working with a genius loci and the nature spirits and all of that kind of stuff. So the foraging, the preparing and the using, all of that feeds into it as well. Um, and so with the Amanita tincture, the aim isn't really to extract the maximum of the active ingredient i want a bit of it in there for sure um and i might use my tincture for meditation for journey work for trance work for that kind of stuff and in my own experience um with amanita when when you're doing that kind of stuff as well as using it you do really don't want the the maximum um but again it, it really just kind of depends on what you're wanting to use it for um but that's really it. I just really wanted to come on and kind of discuss a, a little bit more in depth because I really couldn't be asked to type. Thank you for everyone who um, took the time to comment and to like the video and to watch it. Like I said, everything was done in good nature and I really respect that. And I feel that as a community, that's what we really need to be coming together to do, um, to learn from one another in a respectful way. So thank you, everyone. And um, yeah, hopefully it won't be so long to my next video.